I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sammy Sino, Amanda Silva, and Raj Shah Martinez. Enjoy. Um, so I think just for the interest of time, we'll probably keep going so we can get to the yeah. meat of our bulk uh, with our third paper. And um, I'll just quickly touch on one of the other uh, picks we've had this month for our journal club. Um, this is a paper uh, by Liao et al. coming out of the Changdung uh, Craniofacial Center in Taiwan. Um, and they did the comparative uh, outcomes, looked at comparative outcomes of primary ginger, gingival periosteoplasty to secondary alveolar bone grafting. Uh, in patients specifically that had a unilateral cleft uh, lip and palate. Uh, so they selected uh, 50 chids with the unilateral cleft lip and palate um, over about, I think, it was a five-year period. And then they had uh, 25 in either group who either had, uh, in infancy, the, G, the PGPP or the alveolar bone grafting later on in adolescence when they had mixed dentition. Um, and there's now been a, a series of studies that have looked um, at this type of group. Uh, however, this study here, they looked at uh, the CT data in addition to just 2D imaging um, and some uh, additional outcomes looking at um, uh, the dental roots um, and the residual uh, defect, the only defect that the kids would have. Um, they looked at all the kids, uh, ones that hit adolescence, so they were able to determine uh, how many of the kids with the gingival uh, periosteoplasty actually ended up needing secondary alveolar bone grafting down the road. So it's an interesting head-to-head comparison, but again, the two groups are very uh, mixed in terms of when their surgical interventions uh, were had. Uh, their basic findings were that um, there was an uh, increased need for secondary bone grafting in the kids who underwent um, the gingival periosteoplasty. They said that there's about a 72% success rate, um, but again, that would indicate that 28% of those kids end up going to having secondary bone grafting uh, as a requirement later on because of the bone gaps. Um, there's several factors that lead to this, um, including the difficulty of the surgical procedure, uh, the uh, learning curve associated with it, um, and they actually comment that they have gotten away from doing uh, primary gingival periosteoplasty as of 2003 as well because of fear of uh, maxillary uh, hypoplasia and, and lack of growth, but those kids are also needing to go on to Olaport 1. Um, so this, I think, is adding to some of the uh, growing literature, uh, looking at these two methods for dealing with uh, uh, alveolar clefts. Um, and I think it's just adding to one, some uh, parts of our understanding. I think there are a controversial area. Uh, there's still a lot of mixed opinions about the best way to treat uh, alve- clefts of the alveolus. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that we'll, we'll have to see is how uh, bigger studies or uh, further head-to-head uh, studies also see if they correlate um, to the findings that they've had here or if things will actually uh, mix. And, and if other people, as people learn to do the procedure, maybe in different ways or gain more experience if we have improved success. This, this article kind of ticked me off because I, maybe I didn't understand um, – Maybe I don't understand this, but when Dr. Cutting developed the primary gingival periosteoplasty, it was something that I think the theory was maybe this will eliminate the need for secondary bone grafting. And you're saying in three quarters of the cases, that's true. But Correct. The, the, so if in 25% they need uh, a secondary bone graft, that doesn't sound like uh, the end of the world. Now, if we get to just omitting for a second the maxillary hypoplasia and any disadvantages of it, but am I reading that correctly? That's that's my reading as well. Um, it, you know that because they still needed to do secondary bone grafting, they found that the, when they compared the the gap defects to the gingival periosteoplasty to secondary bone grafting, they had a better fill. But again, that it's exactly what you're saying. The of periosteoplasty occurred, again, in infancy, um, so you're now really comparing to years and years of change to maybe a shorter timeline of change from when you did the uh, bone grafting. Right, but what I, the, the primary gingival periosteoplasty eliminated the need. That was done at the time of the cleft repair, and it eliminated Correct. the need for the bone grafting 75% of the time, right? So why not yep. do it? <laughs> yeah, and the, the authors don't address it other than to say the the fear of the hypoplasia from and needing to have a secondary report. Um, they don't comment is, exactly on how many of those were. Is that like fear of communism or is there like a real, <laughs> you know, something to fear? 
Is it is there some evidence that the the gingival dissection causes you know collapse of the lateral segments? I I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah, you know, like mechanistically, you know, other others have sort of uh, talked about that as well. Um, I think here they had a, a 30% uh, need of, of their patients to undergo the Lafort. Um, perhaps it is just the needing a secondary or even a third procedure that uh, led to this. Um, and only one of their surgeons did uh, primary gingival periosteoplasties, um, but five of them did the alveolar bone grafting. So I think there maybe it's um, and part of it is that the procedure at a young age uh, could be a difficulty, a perceived difficulty. I don't know, Sammy. What do you think if the if the segments are abutting each other at the time of the cleft repair? Is there a reason why you wouldn't do the primary gingival periosteoplasty? I can't think of one. I mean, r- routinely here, surgeon Dr. Flores that's doing a lot of them is is doing that. Um, yeah, they do they do make note of everything being uh, very um, dependent on sort of the surgical technique and surgical. Um, you know, uh, skill, but I, I really can't think of a reason to not to not do that. Um, but there's always been this debate about you know GPP whether to do it or not. I, I think this study at least makes a good attempt to try to compare um, uh, the techniques. And at least, but but you're right. If if the intent was to prevent secondary bone grafting, and 75 percent of the times you have success, it would seem that that would still be a worthwhile. Maneuver. So yeah, it's just interesting the spin that they put on the. Con- yeah. I just mm-hmm. You know, I would put a different spin, and I would have concluded, hey, this is a GPP is a great operation because you don't need a second operation seventy five percent of the time. But they they looked at it differently. Yeah, I'm also not sure why they stopped doing it in 2003 uh, completely. You know, because I think this is before some of the data came out. Um, and they do also comment that it is an, an important aspect that, like you're saying, Dr. Thorne, if they're right next to each other, their limit for when they would do it would be zero to 0.5 millimeters uh, of abutment of the two segments. So it doesn't seem too unreasonable, but again, you know, it's hard, hard to say what's, uh, what the authors are truly thinking as far as their, their rationale for why they would stop it. Right. So you, obviously you need really good pre-surgical orthopedics if you're going to even be in a situation where you can try it. Um, which is maybe one reason to bash it if you if you don't happen to have a colleague who can do it. Right, right. Interesting. So it remains Excellent. controversial. Yeah. <laughs> right. Interesting article. Um, should we move on to the last article? Sure. Yeah, it sounds great. Okay.